Hi folks, we're going to wait a few minutes until it's 7.30 before we start the presentation. So just hang out a few minutes and then we'll get going. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I wanted to welcome everybody tonight. I am Vivian New. I'm the chapter president for the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS, the California Native Plant Society. And welcome to our talk tonight. Uh, I just wanted to apologize if you hear some sound in the background. My I have a parrot and she's being a little loud tonight. So apologies if you hear a little bit of yakking um, there. So. Uh, I'm really interested in knowing if we have people who are new to our talk. So if you happen to be here for the first time at a CNPS talk, I would love to know how you found us. And uh, if you don't mind just typing in chat, if you're a newcomer, um, welcome and welcome to everybody who's been here with us before. Uh, we have John Kehoe giving a talk on gardening for native bees tonight. Hello. <laughs> So welcome, welcome, John. And just have a few things I'm going to go over before John starts his talk. And our talks are not just done by one person. It's not just me and John. Uh, we actually have a team here. So I am your host tonight, Vivian Nu. Our QA moderator is Madeline Morrow. She is uh, actually the past president for our chapter. And on YouTube, we have Shelki Tao, who is going to be watching the chat on YouTube. And so if you have any questions, just whether you're on YouTube or Zoom, type them into chat and we will make sure that John gets them at the end of the talk. Um, but Shilke will be watching the chat on YouTube and she'll make sure that information comes over here to Zoom. So John will be able to answer questions. And if you are not familiar with the California Native Plant Society, it is a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members in 35 chapters, which are all over California and now also Baja California. We even have a chapter that isn't associated with a location, uh, the bryophyte chapter, which specializes in mosses. Um, our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter, and we cover Santa Clara um, County as well as Southern San Mateo County. And CNPS is all about saving native plants and their habitats. So we do that with science, with education, conservation and gardening. And so this talk is really sort of the juxtaposition of all the things that uh, the California Native, native Plant Society is about. And if you are not currently a member, we would really love to have you join. We welcome you to our talks and all our other activities, even if you're not a member, but it helps us uh, to have a louder voice and be able to offer more activities um, if, we, if you wanna join as a member. So if you're interested, uh, membership also will give you these two amazing journals, Flora, which is, covers wonderful gardening topics as well as other information and Fremontia, which is a more science oriented journal. Um, you'll get our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which will tell you about all our activities as well as other interesting articles. And you get discounts at a, a variety of local nurseries that participate in that program. So if that sounds good to you and you're not currently a member, just go to cnps.org join and you can sign up because we would really love to have you. Uh, on Saturday, uh, which also happens to be the start of Native Plant Week, we are having the kickoff for our Going Native Garden Tour. Um, like last year, it is a virtual tour. We're not able to have an in-person tour, but our kickoff is, is going to be featuring uh, public gardens. So after 
to kick off, um, you'll have an introduction to some public gardens that are open now that you can actually go to see yourself. Um, and we'll also have private gardens. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. And you can participate by registering on gng.t.org and you'll get all the information about the kickoff as well as the upcoming events because we will be continuing to have other virtual tours um, later in the year too. And if you're not a member, um, registering for the garden tour will also provide a discount code so that you can join as a new member uh, at a discount. So it's an, it's an extra good deal. And we have a number of events coming up. Uh, next week, we have Flora of the San Joaquin Desert with Ryan O'Dell. That one is going to be a lot of fun, really cool place to visit. And Ryan is a great tour guide to it. On that Friday, we're gonna have our photography group show and tell. If you like to look at pretty pictures of plants or you're just interested, or, or if you're a photographer and you wanna share your own pictures, um, that it's open to everybody and it's a lot of fun. And you can find out more about it on our website, CNP, cnps-scv.org. At the beginning of May, we're going to have a talk from Trails to Gardens, Saw It, Loved It, Planted It by Stephanie Morris. So she's going to be showing you some plants that she's seen out on the trail and then ones that work well in the garden. So that should be a lot of fun. And as I mentioned before, Native Plant Week starts this Saturday. And on our website, cnps-scv.org, um, we have a page of information about Native Plant Week, some of the activities that we're offering, some other activities that you um, might be able to, part you can participate in locally. And uh, it also has a link to the state website, Ch um, California Native Plant Week page, which has uh, activities all throughout the state. So there's a lot of really fun stuff coming up the next week for Native Plant Week. Lots of interesting things. Um, and I, if, you, if you're interested in native plants, which I assume you are since you're here, uh, it's a great time to just sort of check it out. And if you would like to get a weekly message with updates to all the activities that we have going on, uh, I urge you to join our chapter news list. It's just one message a week and it has information about our upcoming activities well, as well as other uh, flowery wildlife, uh, wildflower events uh, in other parts of the state. So that's a fun newsletter just to get information about things that are going on. And we have our chapter nursery. Uh, if you haven't uh, purchased from us, you can do that online. We are currently closed getting ready for Native Plant Week. We are going to be kicking off some specials right after the Going Native Garden Tour kickoff on Saturday. Um, that includes uh, free Dudleya and wildflower seeds with every order. We have a limited supply of showy milkweed in four inch pots for only $4. That's half off the normal price, um, just one per customer. And we also have a limited supply of a Royal Willow in one gallon cans for $6. And in case you didn't know, a Royal Willow, according to Calscape, is the, the tree that hosts the most butterflies and moths. So if that sounds, any of that sounds interesting to you, you can go onto our nursery website now and look around. You can't buy anything yet, but you can look and see what we have in stock. And on Saturday, we will reopen for sales and you can place your order then. And all the proceeds from our nursery sales go to support our chapter activities. Wonderful things like this talk that you are attending right now. And if you are looking for some volunteer activities, uh, we would love to have help, have help with these talks. It's uh, a lot of fun. And as I mentioned earlier, it does take a team to put them on. So if you can point your mouse, click uh, and type on a keyboard, or we can train you for everything else and uh, we would love to have help. So if that sounds interesting to you, just send mail to Johanna Kwan or Madeline Morrow. Their contact information is at the bottom of the page, but you can also find it on our website, cnps-scv.org. And now for a little bit house, of housekeeping. Um, before we start the talk, I would like to ask that everyone please mute their microphones. In fact, I'm actually just gonna mute everybody right now. Uh, 
And if you have any questions during John's talk, please feel free to type them into the chat box at any point. You don't have to wait. Um, at the end of the, his talk, Madeline will be reading those questions to him. So we'll try to catch everybody's questions. Um, we do expect to finish by nine o'clock and we are simulcasting this on YouTube um, where you can watch it pretty much immediately after the talk is over. And now I want to welcome John. He is, um, whoops, excuse me a sec. Uh, he is a longtime member of CNPS and the Xerces Society. He is passionate about the natural wor world, and he's a lead volunteer as well as a board member of the U.S. Stack Natural Area Restoration and Education Project. Um, he's also a regular volunteer at a lot of our CNPS functions. If you've been to our plant sale or uh, other events, you've probably met John because he is just a, he's a great guy and he is always there to help out. Um, his research interests include bees and there's re relationships with native plants. He shares these interests on Flickr, CalPhotos, Bumblebee Watch, and on his YouTube channel, which is a great channel, by the way. So if you have a chance, check that out too. And he frequently also posts on iNaturalist, especially on the California Pollination Project. So John, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you and take it away. All right, thank you, Vivian. Thank you, everyone. The uh, Zoom screen flipped around and did some weird stuff uh, on me, but it's working, right? You can hear me, you can see me? Yes. Yay, I can see myself too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so what I'm uh, going to present is a compilation of a number of years of my presentations that I built to display at libraries and compiled them initially in PowerPoint, but then also went to Keynote and back and forth. So there were some glitches going back and forth, but I think I've got everything tweaked and optimized. And uh, with that, it, you might see some typos or, or funkiness, uh, let me know. Um, if you've watched my YouTube video, Native Bees and Plants, uh, a lot of these slides uh, you'll recognize, but there are some new ones. So with that, now if I do this, so I see my splash screen. I don't see myself. Do you see me? Are you there? I see you, but I do not see your slides. Okay, so. Are you doing the share, share screen right now? There you go. Okay, that was one of the glitches. Now the screen went back to the, okay, never mind. <laughs> All right, so on that note, let's try this. Ta-da, how's that? <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. So it's kind of silly that it says um, what you already know because you all signed up for this. So you know it's Gardening for Native Bees and you know the CNPS Santa Clara Valley Chapters uh, Native Plant Lecture Series is the host. That said, this show is dedicated to Sherry Osaka. Uh, it turns out if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here uh, presenting to you. Years ago, Sherry approached me via email, I think, asking if I would put together a presentation for what was then called Gardening with Natives. And she provided a lot of back-end support for me, consultation, uh, pat on the, the shoulder there, the encouragement. Uh, I, I really, really miss her. She was a, a wonderful person. And if you had a chance to, to meet her, uh, I'm sure you would agree. Uh, she left us much too young. Anyway, my presentation, my show is laid out basically one season of, 
of one bee season, which is almost a year. And I absolutely love this, this slide. I love starting it like this. So what we see here is a black-tailed bumblebee on a sentinel manzanita in late November. Can you believe it? I remember this clearly. It was right after Thanksgiving. This sentinel manzanita is outside our patio. And I looked out there, my wife and I, we looked and said, wow, why is that manzanita flowering so early? It was about a month early. And immediately I thought, uh-oh, what about the bees? To my delight, lo and behold, there's the black-tailed bumblebee feeding on it. There's a lot going on in this picture. Even when I snapped the picture, I didn't fully appreciate it. Depending on how big your screen is, uh, try to focus your eyes on the tongue and mouth parts of the bee. Now her left antennae, antenna is occluding that because it's closer to us, but you can still see the tongue behind the antenna reaching into the flower. She is on this flower for nectar, but she's got little granules of manzanita pollen on her tongue. Because it's November, this manzanita just flowered. She is what's called a founding queen. She hibernated. She was born or emerged as an adult. The previous summer, she made it in the fall, hibernated for a few months here in the Bay Area. And then the cue that told the manzanita the flower is similar to, the same as, related to the cue that wakes up the hibernating bumblebee founding queens. At this time of year, the only bumblebees that we'll see on, especially on Manzanitas, no, the only bumblebees we'll see are founding queens. There are no males yet. We can't see her hind leg in this picture, but I remember when I shot these frames, she had no pollen collected on her hind leg. That's a very important point. I'll, I'll discuss that later. Now I, I've arranged this trying to put close-ups of bees and flowers and then wide angles. This is the very same Manzanita, Arctostaphylus densiflora sentinel. And in the lower right of the frame, you should see the little text box P slash N. That means primarily pollinators will go to these Arctostaphylus species for pollen and nectar. Now, it depends on what guide you read and what research you've read. Uh, primarily though, most critters that we see on manzanitas are going for nectar, but the bumblebees can buzz pollinate. They can do their magic with their wing muscles, their flight muscles. So that's why I put P slash N. So the P slash N or the letter P or the letter N will stay in the lower right if I have that information. Almost all these photos are mine, except for where I've put photo credit in the lower left. So this is also a black-tailed bumblebee, but it's on a dark star Ceanothus. When I saw this bee, I, I was shocked. I thought, wait a minute, we're not supposed to have an all yellow bumblebee in California at all. In fact, I don't know that there's one in North America. Well, if you look closer, this is the, the yellow hairs there and there and there. Classic of the black-tailed bumblebee, but she has covered herself with pollen. So why do bees, especially bees, seek Ceanothus species for pollen? They may get some nectar on some Ceanothus, but she's on this plant for one reason, pollen. And boy, did she dust herself with that. Here's a wide angle of the uh, dark star Ceanothus, not the same plant, but it's the same species. And it's written Ceanothus with the cultivar name in single quotes. So dark star is a cultivated variety or cultivar. You can see how it has a spreading form like a fountain. And look at all those flowers. These feed a lot of pollinators for a number of weeks. OK, 
Okay, let me, there. Now we see a female carpenter bee on Western redbud, Cirsus occidentalis. We're moving into the month of February, late February, actually. And we can see that the weight, the mass of this large carpenter bee has caused the anthers to pop out of the keel section of the red bud flower. And her tongue, you can see it clearly is extended along with her mouth parts there. She's going for nectar, but she knows that there's pollen available on this flower as well. If we look, normally her hind leg, the hairs, it's all black, but we can see there's pollen nestled among those, those hairs. There are the anthers popped out there. Now, once they're popped out, I believe most of the time they will stay popped out, which means other, other critters looking for pollen can, can help themselves to it. Over here, this flower is too young. They're, they're not ready to pop. And down there, pollen and nectar. Here's a wide angle view, Western red bud on the left. That's the very same Western red bud and a Ray Hartman Ceanothus on the right. This is in the month of March. The red bud flowers earlier, uh, earlier than the Ray Hartman Ceanothus, but paired together, these two uh, tree-like shrubs provide uh, pollen especially for many weeks and nectar for sure for the peak of the Western red bud. Very, very popular. In fact, the most common bumblebee that you'll see here in the Bay Area and up and down the coast of California are the uh, yellow-faced bumblebees. This is actually, there's a group. It's not a single species, but the most common species is Bombus vosnesenskii. And they have really neat, tidy hairs, that crisp, clean yellow patch of yellow hairs across the abdomen there. Yellow on the uh, top of the uh, head, a little bit on the front of the thorax, and a full yellow face. Bumblebees are called corbiculate bees, which means the females have pollen baskets, corbicula, and the females consciously seek pollen, moisten it, and pack it onto their hind legs. They'll go back to the nest, scrape it off, and provide that along with the eggs and some nectar that they lay, she laid for their babies. And later on, as she produces worker bees, those females will do the same thing. Which means if you see a bee with pollen on the hind legs, especially a bumblebee or a honeybee, it is a female and it is tending babies somewhere. So that's a Yankee point cultivar Ceanothus. Uh, about two years ago, I guess it was, it was before the pandemic. Actually, it was just before the pandemic. We went on a garden preview in the Saratoga Hills. Uh, it was scheduled through, uh, I think, gardening, going native garden tour. Certainly CNPS. Anyway, check it out. A California buckwheat flowering in February? And not only that, a gorgeous blue mining bee sipping nectar on it. Um, the garden owner, the property owner was, was surprised as well, but there it is. Mother nature works in, in peculiar ways. So buckwheats generally, that's an Ariogonum species uh, buckwheat. The mining bee is an Andrina species. And in this slide, I put nectar, N for nectar. But stay tuned, this gets interesting. Uh, digger bee approaching lilac verbena. This is the lilac verbena de la mina. A uh, wonderful uh, variety that's gained a lot of popularity here in uh, the Bay Area. Mostly it attracts butterflies. You can see the really long tongue and mouth parts of this bee. What do you think he's going for? Well, nectar. Uh, it's a male 
He doesn't have any pollen carrying hairs. It's not a corbiculate bee. Uh, this is a Haberbota species. And in my experience, very, very rare here in the South Bay. I've seen this bee only once. Moving on in March, uh, okay, honeybees aren't native, but they certainly have naturalized. And anywhere you go to look for bees, pretty much you're gonna find honeybees. That's okay, I think they're really cool. The plant is uh, California Phacelia, and we can see there's her tongue. She's on this plant for nectar. She's got to get that flight fuel. Uh, you can't tell from this angle whether she's gotten pollen uh, on this visit or not. And I don't remember when I shot the photo if she had pollen or not. Here's the wide angle view of the same. Uh, this is a group of uh, three. Uh, Phacelia californica is the scientific name. And you can see and appreciate how it, it grows tall-ish excuse me, and kind of spills over this uh, edging, these garden rocks, and produces lots and lots and lots of flowers. They have that, uh, they call it scorpioid uh, form, where they're curled up kind of like the, uh, like a scorpion. And as they bloom, uh, the bloom process moves outward. The point is it flowers and flowers and flowers, and then deadhead it, give it some water, and you'll get more and more and more flowers. They're wonderful. Down here, I put PN for pollen and nectar. Um, pardon the plane if you can hear that. <laughs> Planes fly right over our house. Anyway. Female yellow-faced bumblebee on a silver lupin also called silver bush lupin. These lupins are in the uh, pea family, just like the Western redbud, the Circus uh, species. And you can see, much like that redbud photo, the keel portion of the flower splits, uh, the two petals separate and the anthers pop out. And the bees, the heavy bees uh, instigate that or trigger that and then all the other pollen seeking critters take advantage. This is a bumblebee female. There's the pollen uh, moistened. She's a corbiculate bee. And at the time I shot this, I don't remember if she went in for nectar or just pollen. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, lupins are fantastic for bumblebees. Some of the guides, and I think Calscape says that these are good for butterflies. Uh, I haven't seen many butterflies on these lupins. And my experience with these are at Gulistak Natural Area. We used to have lupins in our front meadow garden. And we learned early on that our neighbor's uh, garden had a lot of snails and the snails moved in and just devoured the young lupin foliage. We don't try to grow lupins in our <laughs> front garden anymore, but there are a number of these at Ulastag and wherever you find them growing, if you pause for a moment, especially this time of year, you're likely to see bumblebees um, enjoying them. This is a tiny sweat bee female. We know it's a female because she's got pollen on her hind legs and she's on a blue eyed grass flower. This bee is a uh, dialectus. They're, they're so tiny, uh, even the experts haven't keyed them out to species yet. So it's just the genus, which is actually a subgenus of Lazioglossum. Anyway, too much information perhaps tiny little bee, but check this out. There's the blue-eyed grass on the left, Cicerinchium bellum. And you can now appreciate those flowers are only about an inch across, making that tiny little sweat bee super tiny, barely a quarter of an inch long. Now, when I had my camera and I was looking for critters to photograph, I wondered if 
you know, what was that, that little thing, little piece of dirt on that flower? So I got in closer and sure enough, it's that tiny little sweat bee. To the right there is saffron buckwheat that's not yet flowered. You can see some of the blossoms. Here we see a, a hybrid buckwheat. It, it's pretty interesting. This is a leaf cutter. And did I do this right? There, pollen. <laughs> that was one of my newest edits. Now, we, earlier I said that the buckwheats, like that mining bee on that buckwheat that was flowering in February, she was on that buckwheat for nectar. And it's true that buckwheats mostly provide nectar for pollinators. And the position of this little leaf cutter bee, yeah, she's getting nectar, but she collected pollen and there's the evidence. So she collected pollen, she's a female, she's a leaf cutter because of the pattern here on her abdomen. And what about this strange hybrid buckwheat? There. So there's the saffron buckwheats on either side, Eriogonum crocatum. And this is in our patio uh, planter box there. And this buckwheat in the center appeared there. And in the first year, this is what it did. Up here, you can see the young blossoms are red and the foliage here looks like red buckwheat that uh, I have to look at my notes. Eriogonum grande var rubescens because we have that variety off the frame to the left of camera. So we figure, well, maybe a seed sprouted from one of these uh, saffron buckwheats that was pollinated by the red. We don't know. Interestingly, as these flowers opened up, that red color was gone. And it's just this very, very pale yellow. Uh, here it is a few years later, there is no longer any hint of this color. And this buckwheat, the, the plant that's there right now, is in fact red. So there's an interesting any botanist in the audience might be able to comment on that and say, well, yeah, that's what they do. I'm not a botanist. <laughs> Moving on, you can't have a talk about Bay, Bay Area native plants and bees without poppies. But there's, there's a bit going on here that doesn't, isn't apparent until we look a little closer. The bottom right there, pea pollen. Our poppies do not provide nectar, which means when we see a bee buzzing around inside of it, it's almost always a female and she's there to collect pollen. Uh, if you see a male bee, he's perhaps confused or maybe he's looking for females or maybe he, it's late in the day and he's gonna sleep there as the blossom closes up. But there's a, uh, the pollen evidence on her hind leg. And a lot of the bees will run around like a hamster wheel to collect that pollen. It's interesting to see, and they become so efficient at it. Now we see a mason bee on a golden yarrow in May. Uh, mason bees are osmia species. They're related to leaf cutters. They're in the same bee family. And um, this variety of osmia, depending on the viewing angle, some folks will say they look like little snowmen because the head is round when you view, view, view it at the correct angle. And the thorax is round, but a little larger. And the abdomen is round, but larger still, like a snowman. But ours are a beautiful, blue-green metallic color. Elsewhere across North America, these come in a lot of uh, shades of just incredible blue, um, but I haven't seen that blue color here in the Bay Area. They might be here. Wide angle view, the golden yarrow, it's not Achillea <laughs> species. Areophyllum confertiflorum, uh, and it, this is in May. And you can appreciate this plant, this one specimen is just an incredible 
pollinator plant, it attracts so many critters. It's, it's like, it's like party central. And down there on the lower right, PN, pollen and nectar, which is true of most of the Asteraceae uh, family plant characteristics. Elegant Clarkia, uh, we have a male carpenter bee nectaring. Now we know that he's a male because this is a foothill carpenter bee and he has these blue gray eyes, this tan patch of hairs aft of his wings. His abdomen has sparse hairs, much like the female. The female is completely black. But even those sparse hairs, if you notice, that is just coated with this sticky po uh, pollen. Uh, Clarkias are in the same Onograceae family uh, as the uh, evening primroses, Onothera, and they produce pollen in sticky threads, just messy threads. Now, the male bees don't collect pollen. They don't go back to the nest. They don't feed the babies. He doesn't care about the pollen. He wants the nectar, and that's why his face is kind of buried in that um, flower there. That's the nectaries right down in there. But you can see clearly when he goes to another elegant Clarkia, he's going to cross pollinate it. He doesn't mind. He probably has no awareness of it. So Clarkia unguiculata. I like saying that word, that name. Here's a wide angle view. Different, uh, different day. Male carpenter be attempting to mate. Key word. Oh, I have to go back. This is important. Notice and take note of the color of this pollen. Okay. Now, male carbon to be attempting to mate. This is quite a, a, a cluster of just gorgeous elegant Clarkias. Their annuals, they reseed if you let them and we let them. So this, this male patrols like a lot of males, a lot of males. And he's looking for a mate. He sips nectar and continues to patrol. The female comes in. Uh, she's looking for pollen, nectar, both. Doesn't, we don't know. But she wanted nothing to do with him. And as I was shooting, she made this high-pitched buzz that even startled me. The whole thing lasted less than two seconds. But look close. Remember that color of the pollen? What's this? That is elegant Clarkia pollen. It's on her hind leg. So check it out. She is putting her leg out there, warding off the guy and saying, hey, <laughs> get out of here. Here's another takeaway. If you see a female, if you see a bee and she's carrying pollen, she's a female and, and she's taking care of babies. Why doesn't this guy realize that? Is he gonna mate with her again? I asked a bee expert this, and to their knowledge, our carpenter bees don't, they're not promiscuous. They don't mate repeatedly. So he, uh, he learned his lesson there. So elegant Clark is wonderful for the uh, carpenter bees, bumblebees too. Female carpenter bee robbing nectar from Cleveland sage. Now we're in the month of June. Uh, this is uh, the valley carpenter bee. She is up to an inch long. She's a big bee. And she pierces the base of flowers because she can't reach down to get the, the, to the nectary in these long tubes. So she pierces it with her tongue and mouth parts and robs the nectar. It's not such a terrible thing for these uh, salvias because much like the other frame where you saw the uh, male, these sparse hairs can and do brush against the anthers of the salvia. The um, Cleveland sage sets its uh, anthers way out there, but you can imagine as she moves from one flower to the next, she can cross pollinate. All she needs to do is to brush some of the pollen onto the stigma right there. 
and that would affect pollination. Hopefully it's the stigma of a different plant. Anyway, looking through the wing there, you can see she's got a nice pack of uh, dry pollen on her scopa. That's the other hind leg there. And she's very well dusted. She fed her babies very well. Here's a wide angle view of a different Cleveland sage. This uh, is at Ulastak Natural Area. So the plant name is the scientific name, Salvia clevelandii. And at the time I took this photo, the width of this salvia was about seven feet. I was uh, there today and that's more like over eight feet now. That does not get any kind of uh, pruning, uh, deadheading. It's a natural area. It's just left to, to nature. Um, so if you're gonna plant Cleveland sage or similar ones, they all get, in my experience, they all tend to get woody and, and just expose this. If you don't like that, um, you need to be more diligent and to do some uh, more diligent pruning, uh, cutting them back, maybe even hard pruning. I don't have much experience with that. So maybe your our CNPS colleagues, um, those of you that know uh, who I am, then you know my wife is Aggie Kehoe. <laughs> and I know I can't just keep asking her. <laughs> but maybe you can. <laughs> so now we have a digger bee. Digger bees are in the same apodee family of bees as bumblebees. And they, uh, a lot of them are roughly the same size and shape as our bumblebees. Uh, this is uh, an Anthophora species and she's coming in to coyote mint for nectar they have no yellow hairs and they're black and white striped, very striking bees. Uh, they fly so fast. They, they come in, sip nectar, browse around a little bit and they disappear. They're very, very challenging to, to photograph. I was lucky to get these. There was no hint of pollen on her hind legs. Uh, another coyote mint, this is Monardella villosa in the month of June. This is a couple of plants uh, that were planted in somewhat close proximity and they form these mounding clumps, if you will, very pretty. And you can appreciate just how much nectar availability is for, for uh, pollinators from butterflies to bees, uh, even hummingbirds. That's why the letter N is down there in the lower right. Uh, California buckweed, Areogonum fasciculatum. And I put an inset of a leaf cutter uh, here. This is in the month of June. This is another specimen at Ulastak Natural Area. And you can probably appreciate it is huge. Like the Cleveland sage, this hardly gets any special care. Sometimes we're obligated to cut back the, uh, we're obligated to prune back the part of the buckwheat that spills over this fence because there's a service road right where I, I'm standing and with the camera. And it's just good form to not let it encroach into the pathway, the road. But the inset photo you can see this uh, buckwheat, the pollen is this kind of pinkish red. The anthers are pinkish red, but the leaf cutter bee has yellow pollen on her abdomen. That's where they pack the pollen on the underside of their abdomen. And that means she did not get any pollen from this buckwheat. So she came here for nectar. And here on the left is a different California buckwheat with a leaf cutter female. And you can see she's got that pollen packed into the hairs on the underside of her abdomen, classic leaf cutter. 
uh, very neat alternating black and white bands uh, on her abdomen, wide head, wide body. And we don't know, I don't know where she got the pollen, but it's not from this buckwheat either. It doesn't, the color doesn't match. And her head is positioned for her to get nectar. On the right, this is the uh, wool carter bee. This is our uh, native species. It's uh, an anthidium uh, maculosum, not that that matters. I think it's a female, I'm not sure. I, if it's a female, I would expect to see more brushy hairs there. Um, regardless, whether it's male or female, uh, at this moment, this bee, this wool carter bee is getting nectar. He or she has got the face way down there and getting nectar from this California phacelia. This is the same plant that I showed you earlier that had the honeybee on it. So these are called leaf cutters. I'll show you why. Wool carter bees, uh, the females scrape woolly fibers off plant leaves and they line their nests with these. They partition cells with the woolly fibers. And you might see one of the females flying with a, looks like a cotton ball uh, clutched under their thorax and abdomen. I've not seen that yet, but uh, that's why they're called wool carter bees, carter as in combing. Oh yeah, leaf cutter and carter bees. <laughs> so there's where, there's the evidence of the leaf cutter female. She cut out a leaf piece and she's flying into the nest chamber where she has her uh, brood and she'll lay an egg. Well, first she'll start aligning with leaf pieces. And when she has a nice chamber, like a pocket, she'll lay an egg and add some uh, nectar to it. Sometimes they make a moistened loaf. Sometimes it's just some juicy nectar with the pollen glob stuck on it. And these bees are cavity nesters, which means they'll, the females seek pre-existing cavities almost always above the ground. This one was right at the ground in a, a fluke or for reasons unknown. Some of these leaf cutters actually nest underground. It's pretty rare though. If you have a bee block, you drill the holes or you buy them prefab. This is one of the bees that you might be lucky uh, getting to move in, as well as the wool carter bee that I showed and the osmia uh, mason bee that was on the golden yarrow. That's the group. And if you're doing your gardening and you see these perfect circles or ovals cut into the margins of your leaves, that's classic leaf cutter evidence. Perfect circles, perfect ovals. If the holes are inside of the leaf, no, that's not a leaf cutter. The females land on the edge of the leaf and with machine precision and speed, they just kind of walk around chopping and boom, they're gone. Just amazing creatures. I just love these creatures. <laughs> Oh, yeah, ribes species. I'm not sure which ribes it was. Uh, now we're in the month of July, a masked bee female on a Grindelia species. I'm not sure which Grindelia this is. It's a low growing one. This was at Ulistak Natural Area. And there were a couple of locations where these were. And the, the sign, there were no signs. The plant tags were long since lost or forgotten. But to give you a, a greater appreciation, this gum plant, this section here, the mid section is about one inch across, making this be not e about, no, not even a quarter of an inch long. She is tiny. We know she's a female because this part of her face is black. So these, these neat little yellow marks, pale yellow marks, classic female, uh, mast B. The genus is Hyleus, some pronounce it Hyleus. And uh, as neat as they are, 
they are not pollinators. The reason is they have almost no hairs on their body. They look like tiny but fat wasps, kind of. And the females ingest pollen, they store it in a crop, and then back at the nest, they regurgitate it. So how about any uh, future bee biologist or current bee biologist? Can you imagine the job of studying that? You're, you're gonna do a microscopic study of the regurgitative matter in a bee that size? Anyway, apropos that we're in a pandemic because the male mast bee, that middle part of the integument of his face is the same color. So it looks like a mask, kind of like what we're wearing now. So there's the compound eye, hard to appreciate, but there's the right compound eye, there's the left compound eye. And if that were to be complete, the bee would look masked. That's the name. Now, this is a wide angle view of an unknown Grindelia species. Uh, my wife provided this picture from the Master Gardeners Sunnyvale Teaching and Demonstration Garden, STDG. Uh, this picture is many years old and my wife doesn't even remember what species it was, but you can appreciate uh, gum plant. It's obviously an Asteraceae family member. The buds form this white gummy substance just before they flower. And as it flowers, you can actually see the white gum fade and the uh, ray and disc flowers form. Um, strangely, there are no pollinators evident in this photo. I'll uh, elaborate on that later. A male longhorn bee, uh, Helianth on Helianthus californicus. Common name of this is California sunflower. Uh, it's a uh, perennial, and it is also a dual stack natural area. They're called longhorns, not because they have long horns. These are the antennae, and the males have amazingly long antennae, presumably because they can better sense females. Uh, antennae in bees also provide olfaction, and I guess that's why they have especially long antennae. This, as a male bee, they're really hairy bees. He, like the other male bees, he doesn't care about the pollen. He's not collecting it, but the pollen really sticks to him all over him so that when he goes to another Helianthus californicus, he can cross pollinate it. But he's here for the nectar right there. The plant provides both pollen and nectar, and we can certainly see that in this photo. The female looks much like him but with more normal length um, antennae. And you'll probably see lots and lots of pollen packed onto the female's hind legs. Uh, now we're moving into late summer, the season's uh, past peak, I think. And this is a female membrane bee. Uh, membrane because uh, she, some, some folks call them polyester bees. These bees create a resin uh, polyester-like cellophane substance that they line their uh, root cells with. And that stuff is incredibly durable. Um, this is at um, just outside the visitor center at Alviso, the Don Edwards uh, Preserve visitor center in Alviso. It's near a bunch of St. Catherine's Lace buckwheats, and some of those have signs. This buckwheat resembles those, but it's kind of different. So maybe it's a St. Catherine's Lace, maybe not. Um, anyway, 
the tapered abdomen, the black and white bands on her abdomen is classic. She's only about three eighths of an inch long, maybe slightly longer. She packs pollen on her hind legs from about the tibia there all the way up to the hairs on her thorax. So sometimes you'll see them just loaded with pollen. Um, so membrane, because it's a membrane that they line their cells, uh, nest cells with. Uh, polyester, because it has a polyester type quality. Um, so that's, that's why. I've only seen this bee at Don Edwards. And now uh, end of season, we're into October. It's a California buckwheat. It's still got some flowers uh, blooming on it, but mostly the plant is, is at end of life. And so is this bee. It's a leaf cutter. It's bedraggled. The trailing edges of the wings are tattered. The hairs are mussed up. This bee isn't, wasn't long for uh, this world, but like um, nearly all of our bees, they have a, a quite a short life, some of them only a few weeks. Um, the exceptions to the rules are queen bumblebees and some of our large carpenter bee females can live long, some of them for many years. So in summary, and our winners are, Arctostaphylus, the manzanitas for pollen and nectar. Ceanothus, called ceanothus or lilacs for pollen, mostly because we found evidence where sometimes there's nectar and pollen. Areogonum, the buckwheats for pollen and nectar, depending. Salvia, sages or salvias for nectar. Um, to my knowledge, Bees don't go to salvias for pollen. I, I think they, they only collect the nectar to keep flying. Not sure on that. Now I put this also with the double asterisks because I thought, wait a minute. I learned about these fantastic four from a CNPS member. Somebody coined that phrase, fantastic four. And when I went through my photos, I thought, Wow, look at that, that's true. So I highly, highly, highly recommend if you're looking for plants and you're not sure and you wanna attract pollinators, especially bees, look for varieties in these genera. There are so many to choose from, but wait a minute, what about Asteraceae? These are our sunflowers. They provide pollen and nectar. How come they aren't at the very top of the list? Well, I, I've read up on that and it really depends on what you read and who wrote it and what studies they cite. But one book, uh, it's almost like a textbook for entomologists. There are studies that have found that the pollen from certain Asteraceae plant members is low in protein and that the offspring from those uh, hives or nests fared poorly. These uh, entomologists go to great lengths at studying into such detail. I'm, I'm humbled at their, their perseverance and their commitment to that. So I think that's why Asteraceae isn't in the Fantastic Four. Um, and in my own experience, when I walked around, like looking at those gum plants, uh, my wife planted uh, uh, Grindelia hirsutula, the hairy gum plant, and it's, it's been our garden. And I've looked and looked and looked. I, I almost never see pollinators on it. And some of these gum plants that I've seen locked at, looked at at Ulastac and, and other places, like, hmm. So there's... For me, the Asteraceae are a hit or miss. You might get the right species uh, in, in the right setting in your garden and you've hit gold and everybody's happy. So yeah, share your experiences about that. And then of course, uh, V, various annuals, because 
like I, like I showed you with the elegant Clarky is they are just super fantastic. I have lots and lots and lots more uh, photos and I've created my YouTube channel. There's a little bit more. I've uh, opened up a new Gmail account as I'm trying to taper off that old one. Uh, there's my uh, Flickr page, um, iNaturalist. And I found if you're, if you're on YouTube and you just do a search and you key in John Kehoe California Bees, you'll find my channel. And I have posted some short videos on bees and plants that have other, other flowers and other bees that uh, I just could not include in this presentation because of the timeliness. And I, I was, I'm always concerned about running too long and having the facilitator nudge me. <laughs> it's like, we're running out of time. So I hope I didn't go too fast. Uh, so with that, um, I guess that's my presentation. Let me go back to to Zoom. Okay, my oh. Zoom picture just... Well... Do you want to stop sharing? Or do you want to keep this up? Um... I think stop sharing is probably best because anybody that wanted to copy it has done so by now. Okay, you should have a button to stop sharing. Yeah, so I clicked it, it says pause share. Huh. It doesn't say stop share. Well, that's interesting. Vivian, do you have an idea? Oh, on this? I'll, I'll do. I'll just do a, a quick. Uh, I'll take it away from John, and then I'll stop my own share. I hope. Uh, okay, so let's yeah, start yeah. with. We we do have quite a number of questions. Thank you for that incredible talk. Um, Thank you. <laughs> one talk question was: Are all these photos from the Bay Area, specifically South Bay? I thought yes, but. Yes, thank you. Thank you for asking. Yes. Not only are they all from the South Bay, they're actually Santa Clara Valley. I, I didn't make the time and effort to go up into our foothills and beyond. And there were a number of questions, and maybe you just want to briefly go over this, about, um, about hives or not hives, honey, um, and just maybe do a quick overview on our native bees, on, on their habits. Great, thank you. That, that's a wonderful question and, and uh, I should have mentioned that. Uh, all of us, well, no, most of us are quite familiar with honeybees and the concept of hives, but honeybees are quite unique. They are the world premier hive uh, creature. They have one queen, one resident queen only, and the queen stays in the hive and she just lays eggs and eggs and eggs. And she produces far more worker bee females that are non-reproductive. And of course, she'll lay some male eggs to, for the robustness of the long-term survivability. And when it's the right time, she lays new queens and then the whole hive dynamic starts to, to change. Because uh, honeybees aren't native and there's so much to know and learn about them, I've only read over uh, that. And although I enjoy it, I dovetail that into the, the closest connection we have in native bees to honeybees is bumblebees. Similar to 
honeybees, our bumblebees have only one queen and they have a hive kind of a co uh, colony that's much, much smaller. Uh, most of our bumblebees, especially here in the Bay Area, will find pre-existing cavities in the ground, uh, burrows, rodent burrows and the like. And she will, after she, that founding queen where my presentation opened up, she will browse around looking for food and then look for a burrow to create her nest. She then goes in there, tidies up the place, decides it to go. She starts laying eggs, builds her colony, and that hopefully thrives. She starts laying female workers. And with the bloom period, which we can help by keeping lots of flowers throughout the season, she can keep her family going. She'll have more and more and more workers that will keep bringing more pollen and nectar back to the to that hive or nest. It's actually a nest. And uh, late in the season, she will produce the new queen eggs and the cycle repeats. Um, the uh, cavity nesters like leaf cutters, wool carters, mason bees, those, uh, all of those females are reproductive. So they don't have a queen, they don't have a colony. Same thing with our, um, sweat bees, they're called solitary bees. Once the females have mated, the male just goes off and feeds and then dies. Uh, he doesn't really, he might try to mate again, but he doesn't have any purpose in life anymore. The female, she gets busy uh, laying eggs, securing a nest and filling it with eggs, sealing up each cell. Uh, the ground nesters, like the sweat bees, they, they go into ground and diggers, they literally dig in the ground, sometimes in quite hard packed earth. They're amazing. They can actually drill with their mandibles. But anyway, they are also uh, solitary bees and they don't meet their young. They die off. So when the, the young, uh, the larvae, the egg hatches to a larvae, the larvae feeds on the provisions left, uh, they form pupa, so they go through that pubation period. And then pretty much a year later, there are exceptions, they emerge never knowing their mother or father, and then the cycle repeats. Now there are some of these bees, some sweat bees, and even I think some of the digger bees, they form aggregations of colonies so that they share a nest entrance, like in the ground. Maybe you're out hiking, you see a hole with a whole bunch of a ridiculous amount of activity there. Uh, what scientists, entomologists have found is a number of females, mothers, enter the same nest entrance, but below ground it branches off and each branch is its own female egg layer. Um, and some of the females actually cooperate. So it's, it's like a semi-social where some of the females will guard the hole while the others are out. So the, the whole community is beneficial. The large carpenter bees are yet again a little different. They are the ones that will actually bore into wood. They are true carpenters in that sense. And they uh, have somewhat a bad reputation for drilling into uh, structure wood like uh, the eaves of our homes or outdoor gazebos and patio uh, covers, etc. And they drill in the hole there. And when the mother is satisfied, she starts laying eggs. But what they found is mothers and daughters can share that and they can dig it deeper and deeper and longer so that one, one uh, 
large carpenter bee, those are the xylocopa species because the small carpenter bees are serotina. Anyway, the large ones, some of those you, you'll probably readily find pictures where they had x-rayed uh, a log or a piece of lumber and the carpenter bee uh, cavity was like three feet long. And they saw that on x-rays rather than destroying the wood and the, the inhabitants if there were any. But I asked this in the bee class that I took offered by the Jepson Herbarium. If mothers and daughters can share that carpenter bee nest and carpenter bee females can live for years, is it conceivable that grandmothers, mothers and daughters share the nest? And the bee biologist that I asked said she didn't know but she agreed that that is conceivable. So that's an area of, of study worth pondering. Um, so many of our bees are exceedingly hard to study to, to answer that completely. But I think, I think I hit the high notes there. So um, as I've been told that um, our native bees are much less aggressive than um, honeybees because most of them, the only way the female can carry on her DNA is to go back to her, her nest and supply it. So you have to really kind of stomp on them for you, for them to sting you. It's not like there's, there's clone, you know, sterile bees that sacrifice themselves. Yes. Thank you. That's, that's a very good question and some very good points. Yes. So our honeybees have a barbed stinger and that means that the, the worker bees, they will sting because they're all about protecting the hive, the survival of the species, not the individual. So the worker honeybee sacrifices themselves for the greater good of their huge colony. Um, but our native bees don't have barbed stingers, which means they can sting repeatedly. But the female knows, much like Madeline uh, said, and others, the female's job is to waste no time to get out there, get enough nectar, get as much pollen, and get back to the nest build that colony. Uh, she made it already at the beginning of the season. And she is all about the babies, her nest, her babies. And I have, you've seen my photos with the macro lens. I have to get very, very close. The, the nose of my lens is about eight inches or so from the bee and I have to move in real slow, but never have I had a bee attack me. There's one exception. <laughs> so I showed you the, um, the wool carter bee, that, that two screen shot, the wool carter bee was the one that had the um, black spot, the black abdomen with the yellow spots. The, we have a uh, European wool carter bee here in the Bay Area that's gaining uh, numbers. And those, those males are so aggressive. Now, male bees don't have stingers. They cannot sting. But <laughs> the Urban Bee Lab at Berkeley had nicknamed those bees head bonkers because quite literally, those male bees in trying to protect their territory and to chase everything away from their females, potential females, their mates, they will dart at us. <laughs> it can be a little intimidating, but no, male bee, no male bee has a stinger. So the only bee, bee, uh, bees that can sting are females. And not only have I never been stung you know, by a, a native bee, I've not been stung in the state of California. 
And uh, the staff at the Urban Bee Lab at Berkeley also had acknowledged that no one has been stung there. So thank you for that question. Okay, here's another different one. Um, someone is talking about in their yard, they have a large salvias bees bliss about 450 square feet. And there's also rosemary near, near it from the original landscaping. Early in the season, the honeybees are mainly on the rosemary and the bees, native bees on the native bees bliss salvia. But recently we see mostly honeybees on the bees bliss and fewer native bees. They're in an agricultural area. Are the honeybees driving away the native bees? Thank you. That's another excellent question. And it, it does come up a lot. And the answer from bee experts that I've talked to and um, articles that I've read, et cetera, the answer depends. The key thing that the person asking the question mentioned is it's an agricultural area, which I can only imagine. The number of honeybees in that area would be formidable. I wouldn't be surprised if it's multiples of hundreds of thousands. And in those cases, um, it's probably plausible that the honeybees have just outcompeted with the native bees. The, uh, the, there are a few caveats though. Honeybees cannot buzz pollinate and our bumblebees are premier buzz pollinators. And the person mentioned uh, salvia. Well, the salvias, uh, bees go for mostly for the nectar. But in desperate times, in times of shortages, the bees are going to go with what's available. And I have heard and read that in a power of numbers, yeah, the honeybees can overwhelm and just strip out the, the, the supply of both pollen and nectar if there, there just aren't enough native bees. Uh, I have observed bumblebees and honeybees on ceanothus and other uh, plants like buckwheats. And in my experience, the bumblebees are the aggressors. It's almost like the bumblebees just simply ignore the fact that there's a honeybee there and they just bump them away. They just plow right into them. It's not like they're, they're fighting a fight posture, but if there's enough resources, then the answer is no, honeybees don't um, outcompete with our native bees because the where form meets function, the size and shape of our native bees with native plants, the, the shape of the bee and it's the length of its tongue and mouth parts and it, its legs and feet, all of these features give our native bees the advantage. Well, that segues into the next question, which bees depend on native flowering plants? I believe we're referring to native bees here and which are generalists and can also use non-native ornamentals. Um, that is uh, a really, that's a really broad topic. Um, that get that, that segues in, into a lot of bee biology and entomology terms. Um, depending on who you talk to and what you read, bumblebees, uh, I am convinced, are generalists. But there is a pattern, a foraging pattern called constancy. Honeybees are also generalists, but they exhibit a greater commitment to constancy, which means when a female honeybee leaves the nest and she sees, and maybe she's learned this from her sisters, that over there is a, uh, a salvia, go there and harvest what you can. When she, that whole trip that she's on will only be on salvia. That's the reason why when we go to the, the market, uh, and you can see, you can buy clover honey or Florida's world-renowned Tupelo honey, 
um, how can they, how can the beekeeper or the honey producer, it's usually the beekeeper, how can they say it's clover or tupelo or orange blossom? How can they say that? Because that's the behavior pattern of the honey bee. Bumblebees are generalists. Now you might watch a bumblebee go from, you know, buckwheat to buckwheat to buckwheat, but keep watching because I showed you that the California poppy produces only pollen. If you stage bee plant near California poppy and watch, the female will get pollen from the poppy and then fly up to the bee plant for the nectar. The bee plant, it's a scrofularia species. I forget the full scientific name, but they have these little cup flowers, tiny little cups. And you watch these big bees and hummingbirds, they go there, it must produce copious nectar and it refills. Anyway, I have watched a bumblebee go from Douglas iris to poppy to uh, buckwheat, all in the same trip. Um, so rather than focusing on generalist versus specialist, um, I, I think trying to keep it simple uh, as, as native plant enthusiasts and native bee enthusiasts, more on general terms, stick with native plants that, that you want to have that are good for your area and build a garden that is pleasing to both you and pollinators. And the Calscape webpage is great if you use the what grows here tool. Uh, I hope that's a satisfactory answer. Um, another non-bee related question is, what lens do you use? <laughs> well, because I, I was on Flickr for years, and as I became enamored by bees, I was taking pictures of plants and flowers, and I realized, okay, I need a, I need a macro lens, I need a better lens. So I looked on Flickr, and I noticed uh, the number that kept coming up was somewhere around 100 millimeter, 100 millimeter macro. And because I had already committed to buying a Canon camera, it was just a preference years ago. So I bought the Canon 100 millimeter macro and I still use that. Um, some people like uh, if you're in the, the Sony camp of cameras or the Nikon, there are so, so many to choose from. Um, the key for me, and I, I can say as a recommendation, whatever lens that you're in the market for, choose one that includes a macro feature. It should say it on the lens itself. <laughs> and, um, So this was, um, so any other photo tips? How do you manually focus so quickly? <laughs> yeah. So my go-to book from the beginning of my study of bees is the California Bees and Blooms Guide that was produced by uh, Dr. Robin Thorpe, who passed away a few years ago, and Gordon Frankie at Berkeley in collaboration with California Native Plant Society. Um, the photographer that took almost every picture in that book, I don't know if you can see or it's mirrored, but anyway, California Bees and Blooms, um, a guide for gardeners and naturalists. So Roland, Rowling Colville is the photographer. And I talked with him at the bee workshops and he's a passion, a passionate uh, photographer for manual focus. Stand there at a plant that has a lot of pollinators on it. Stage yourself, manually focus on the range, maybe rotate at the hips or shoulders so that in an arc from your camera, you know that that's, that's your focal plane of the camera and work with that. I tried that and I just cannot do that. 
So I use the autofocus feature of my camera and the camera bodies, the newer and newer camera bodies have gotten better and better. And so I choose a uh, point autofocus, but at the point, and I almost always set that focal focus point, the autofocus point spot center. Um, it doesn't always work, uh, but it's, it's really tricky. And then there's the technique of actually, all right, here I am, I'm at this Cenothus or whatever, and there's bees and critters all over it. Life is good. Let me quietly hold the camera up at my face there and move in. And which way is the wind blowing? Do they smell me? Do they smell me but not care about me? Uh, do they care about my shadow? That all depends on the critter. Uh, bumblebees don't seem to care one iota. Um, it, it takes a lot of patience and because it's digital, expect to just waste so many frames and just keep practicing. <laughs> Another question, are, are daisies all low, um, low pollen? But of course daisies, I, I don't know, are most plants in Asteraceae low pollen or is it impossible to generalize? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but maybe they added more to that. No, it was a little cryptic. Um, I guess you were referring to like, I think the yarrows or something as not being, not being, um, you hadn't observed them to be that um, helpful, to, you know, didn't have that many bees on them. Were you saying they were low pollen? Yeah, so looking at various Asteraceae, all the way up to the family level of Asteraceae, which includes so many plants. Um, I wondered why Asteraceae wasn't included in the Fantastic Four, or maybe call it the Fabulous Five or something. I didn't coin the Fantastic Four expression, <coughs> pardon me, but the um, I wondered why these, uh, for example, gum plants, these grandelias, I wondered why they weren't the bee magnet that I thought they should be because they're gorgeous plants. They've got loads of, of pollen right there. I'm looking at it. And it wasn't until I read my latest book, uh, the textbook that, let me reach in. I don't know if holding it up to the camera helps. Yes. Help you. Very clear. You have a great camera. Um, I don't know if it is it backwards. It's the font. No, the no, it's it's good. You must be mirroring. Okay, yeah, good. So, I I I saw this book. Um, this is uh, Brian Danforth is an active entomologist, and the co-authors are former entomologists. This is a tough read. <laughs> uh, there are words in here that I. I don't know the meaning of, but in this book, they cite studies where pollen, when they observed bees or the studies that were cited in this book, pollen that was harvested from Asteraceae plants had low protein value and the bees, the babies, the adults that emerged subsequent to that were generally smaller and weaker and the number of viable uh, adults produced was, was relatively low. And I wondered, is that the reason why, do, do, do the bees that we see foraging about, do they know that? Do they know that, for example, the hairy gum plant in our backyard is, is just not good for them, so they bypass it. Uh, they go for the buckwheat or, um, See what else is in flower when the gum, that hairy gum plant. Oh, we still have some late flowering. Uh, we have a skylark ceanothus that flowers later um, and the bumblebees are there. So th there's a lot more study that, that needs to go on. And we have a lot of questions. I think uh, maybe I'll 
obviously this talk has sparked a lot of discussion. Um, wow. <laughs> um, one of them about uh, native bees using water. Um, somebody rescued one from a fountain. I observed when I put in a, um, a rock trickle fountain that yeah. I get a lot of bees and other insects going onto the damp parts of the rock. Yes, I thank you. I don't have to rescue. I don't have to rescue them. Unlike when I had a pool, and they, I guess, the water tension would capture them. Yes, thank you. Excellent, excellent question. So, our native bees, for the most part, don't need supplemental water. Honeybees do. Okay. The honeybees actually need water to go back to the hive, and they blend the water with the the, the nectar and the honey. So getting that, keeping that honey at honey consistency is the reason why honeybees go back to the nest with water. Also on hot summer days, the honeybee workers will help use uh, evaporative, the evaporative nature of water to help keep the nest cool. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, honeybees are lousy, they can't swim. And we rescue them from our little bird baths all the time. It's like, come on, bees. You, you know that expression, sink or, you know, swim or sink. Well, too many of them just simply sink. But among our native bees, the digger bees, um, there's a group of female digger bees that will go and find water, bring it into their crop, and then go back and dribble it onto the ground to moisten that hard packed dirt. And then they'll walk in circles with their mouth, their mandibles as a drill bit of sorts, and they'll spin around in a circle. It's, I've not seen it, but I've, I've seen it written as described. They need water for that. Um, I'm not sure our other native bees need water. And yeah, a pool that anything that has something that breaks the surface tension of water, such as a pool, or if you put soap or uh, any kind of a solvent type of thing, uh, the, the bees will just, they, they, they sink. I, I, I guess I mostly get honeybees and some of the wasps come to, to drink. Yeah, wasps, they're carnivores and maybe they need uh, the water to I don't know, help with their, their babies. And do one more question. Um, somebody wanted to um, clearing up about bees collecting pollen from salvia or I guess salvia doesn't wait is salvia both pollen and nectar or just one great thank you um the guides will say as far as the when, when a bee is seeking nectar they'll go to salvia so if you have a garden that's just loaded with with pollen uh, plants, uh, putting some salvias in there will help the, the bees because uh, they need the nectar for um, flight fuel. They need those carbohydrates. But the uh, my newest um, YouTube video that I just posted on my channel, Pondering Pollen, I included a, a close-up of a uh, creeping salvia uh, blossom and it shows two anthers, let me see if I, with, that reach out like this. So my hands are the anthers and my arms are the stamens. And in the center is the stigma. So that when the bees go there for nectar, the anthers are perfectly aligned to brush the side of the furry bumblebee, digger bee, whatever, carpenter bee. So the bees aren't necessarily going to collect that, but maybe the female knows. 
That's that's a good question. And because, you know, salvia is such a big genus and we have so many wonderful ones, you look closer at the, the white sage flower, the black sage flower, and the Cleveland sage flower, the morphologies are all different. So that would appeal to different shape and size bees. I may have missed a few questions, but we are at nine o'clock. And right. I would encourage people who want to know more to go find John's YouTube channel. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Over to you, Vivian. Okay, well, thank you so much, John. Thank you, Madeline, for asking the questions. And actually, thanks for the audience. I noticed there are a lot of people who are helping with answers, too. So really Yay. enjoyed having you. And I just wanted to remind everybody, Native Plant Week is coming up. There's a lot of great activities uh, starting on Saturday. So, well, well, I hope we see some of you at our Going Native Garden Tour kickoff on Saturday. And we'll have uh, specials at the nursery and wonderful plants that John has shown us. And by the way, we put um, in the chat the link for John's plant hang handout. So if you didn't catch everything on the slides, there's actually a handout that John provided for us that you can download. And you can get a copy of the chat if you're on Zoom. Um, if you go down to the bottom, there's a dot, dot, dot. And that little dot, 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 if you click on it, it's next to the file. It'll, it'll say, um, save the chat. So you can keep a copy of the chat with all the links and, and useful other useful information there. And, and also, oh. the, the chat also, we're gonna, this talk will show up on YouTube and the chat is preserved with it. So you'll be able to get info from that as well. The, the YouTube chat, yes. So, and that is available now. So awesome. um, thank you everybody. And thank you, especially John. It was just terrific having you tonight. And uh, good thank night everyone. And uh, hope to see you soon. Yes, thank Bye -bye. you. Have a good night. <laughs>